Welcome back to another UNC basketball podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you are watching us on our incredibly fast growing YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher, Andrew Jones, and joining me is our director of basketball recruiting and analyst, longtime AAU college and high school coach, Mr. David Sisk. And David, the season is over. North Carolina national runner up, falling 72 69 Monday night to Kansas at the Superdome. Uh, Tar Heels finished 29 and 10. They went 17 and 4 to close out the season, including in those wins late in the season at Duke. Versus Duke in the Final Four. They beat the defending national champion Baylor in overtime, not far from Baylor's campus, knocked off UCLA. And on a night they shot 31.5%, they were a Caleb Love jumper at the buzzer away from going into overtime with Kansas. So having seen everything play out the way that it did, especially these last five weeks or so, what are the first couple of things that come to your mind when you think about what this Carolina team became? Gosh, I, I guess you uh, look at the results more than you do the process. Uh, I guess we get a big breakfast here. Instead of watching them make the sausage, we get to sit at the table. Uh, I just go back to uh, what that team was earlier in the year, you know, and, and, and I think we were fair, but, but you know, we were definitely – we didn't have uh, – we weren't shaking the pom-poms, you know, uh, early in the year and then – Miami, Wake Forest, and all that. And it took me a long time to jump on the bandwagon. But you could just see the difference in the team, uh, the way they played. Uh, and, you know, and I, I think about the heart that they played with uh, against Duke, the heart that they – and all through the tournament. Uh, but you think about the last weekend against Duke, against um, obviously Monday night, even though they didn't win – they, they just played with incredible heart against Kansas and just kept bouncing back and bouncing back and wouldn't die. And you could tell they, they had such an emotional, they let out so much emotion Saturday and it had to take a lot out of them. But I mean, they, they just fought. I mean, you, you look at them, you're, you're looking at uh, guys getting hurt during the game, you know, Puff Johnson, you know, throwing up on the court and, they caught basically being, you know, to play till he didn't hey till he basically couldn't walk. And he, got, he they helped him onto the dais for the post game yeah, press conference. Yeah. He had to get help on and off the dais. So if they would have had a game two or three days later, he wouldn't play. He would be out yeah. for a while. And you just think about that. We we just thought earlier in the year that this just wasn't a tough North Carolina team, you know. And that didn't come from us. That came from national guys. Right. That, that, yes, that they watched them play, uh, you know, against Purdue and, uh, uh, or not Purdue, rather, but, but Tennessee and, and, and some of Kentucky and, and some of those teams. And, and, you know, the basically the narrative was you punch them in the nose or punch them in the mouth and they're not going to respond. They're going to go in the fetal position. And this team was anything but that for the last six weeks. I mean, it, it was really – you got to see a team grow up and, and really get tougher skin and grow some tough hide right in front of your eyes. Not only get better skill-wise, but, I mean, you saw a bunch of guys grow up. As a coach, and you've coached a variety of different levels, and uh, I, would, I would imagine getting a team to be tough sort of requires the same kind of approach. The difference with this club – is every time that they were humiliated, it was a national story. Everybody saw it. You know, a lot of the national media that were there in New Orleans this week and asking the questions about that, one in particular, you know, manned up. And he said, look, I was wrong. I called you guys soft, and, 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 and you weren't time, but you're not now. And, and, and the players kind of said, yeah, you know, he, Jeff Goodman got us going in some respects. But when they played really well, like against Michigan, like when they had blowout wins, like against Florida State or NC State, stuff like that, nobody noticed. Nobody, they, yeah, whatever. It was the it was the Tennessee game. It was the Kentucky game. It was the way they 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 did not fight late at Notre Dame. It was the week they went to Coral Gables and and Winston Salem. And then when you thought, okay, they figured some stuff out, Pittsburgh happens. And I think that's when people shovel dirt on them. A lot of people shovel dirt on them. But they, they fought through it. 
like they, they had, I guess maybe they needed to be humiliated five or six times instead of four or five times, if you know what I mean. So as a coach, do you sometimes see a team that just need, they just need to get whacked. They need to get punched in the face, fall to the canvas and just left there in order to figure out how to get back up eventually. You know, I don't, I guess so, because it happened here. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you were talking about Jeff Goodman, Dick Vitale called the game against Kentucky the most, the worst performance, the most unspirited performance, called it embarrassing that he'd seen from North Carolina. And I think it was 42 years, if I'm not mistaken, that was the number he threw out there. It may have been more mm -hmm. than that. I don't know where he came up with that number, but it was like yeah. for decades. Um, you know, coaches usually recruit, if they want tough teams and are big on toughness, that's who they go after. They go after tough guys. And Hubert Davis really didn't have a luxury of choosing his roster uh, and, and choosing the type of guys that he wanted. Uh, so, you know, it, it is an interesting thing, but uh, we, we all kind of knew, and Hubert had said it throughout the year. If you'll remember earlier in the year, people asked him, and he said, look, I was a competitor, and these guys are not competing, and I really don't understand it, and, and I don't know how to remedy. You remember him saying that. Yeah, I really yeah. don't know what to do about it because they don't want it as yeah. much as I want it. So, you know, like I said, they just – I don't think he ever gave up on the team. I think he kept coaching. I think it's obvious. And I think the players were a sponge. And maybe there comes a point to where you say, and I know coaches are big on this, where it just comes to a point where the player just ends up saying, you know, you're right. Our way don't work. I think you know, that happened with this. Your way. And that may have been what happened. Yeah, Brady Manick said Sunday, in the breakout room interviews, he was asked about Hubert putting a picture of a Superdome in their lockers, beginning a practice and having a Zoom call with all the parents and told them all, make reservations in New Orleans. Brady said, and I quote, it was pretty corny that he would say that. And I think the, he was telling the players all this stuff. I think they had a hard time believing. So Hubert has this mission. He's, I see all these things in you guys and you don't see them in yourselves yet. And I, I wonder where that process changes over. Sometimes guys don't see that in themselves yet. They think that because they wear the uniform and they are North Carolina, that there's a certain entitlement there. And, and a lot of people thought that too. And I think Caleb Love basically said that after they lost to Notre Dame, he said, well, you know, they lost to Boston college and we just crushed them. So we didn't take them seriously without computing the other side of the equation, which was that Notre Dame also beat Kentucky, and Kentucky wiped the floor with Carolina. I think this team just kind of had loose minds throughout, throughout a good portion of the season. Some guys may have been a little bit more connected to what Hubert's message was than others. They just kind of needed everyone to sort of come along. And in the end, that week in Coral Gables in Winston-Salem, and then Garcia leaving, maybe that shook the tree a little bit around the program. And then the Duke game at home. And then one last final reminder, which is what I call the pit game. That to me was the icing on the cake. That's when they realized they have no room for error. They're not as good as maybe they thought they were uh, in, as individuals. They needed to play with grit because they weren't going to be able to win games without being gritty. And the irony is from that point on, they, they were the number five team in America with adjusted defensive efficiency. And I think when you're that good defensively, it means you're gritty. Their rebounding numbers went way up, especially offensive rebounding went up, and their points off of offensive rebounds, points per offensive rebound went up significantly. They went from rebounding like 28.5% of their misses to rebounding about 40, 40 to 41% of their misses. That's all grit. That's all effort stuff and having natural talent. It looked to me like the grit meter just went way up and it kind of went up all at the same time. So when you look back at some, the way some of those losses were, were, were placed in there, how they occurred, when they occurred, is it possible that they just needed another whooping, another reminder once and for all, and the pit game was that reminder? Could have been. Uh, you know, Lou Holtz would always say when when he was, I guess it was ESPN, ABC, who was with when he was a college football announcer, he and Mark May, a team would get beat. or uh, And he would always say, 
let's do, I'm, I'm taking them next week. And they might be, it might be a team, uh, let's say it might be North Carolina playing Clemson in football. So North Carolina loses the week before and Clemson wins big. And he would say, I'm taking North Carolina coach. The coach has got them where they want them, you know, because, yeah. you know, he can tear them down early and then build them up. But everybody's going to be telling them how they're no good. He said, the coach has got them right where they want them. And this other team's just going to be getting pats on the back and everybody telling them they're great. You know, Dick Saban's always going on about the rat poison. Yeah. I think Dabo even picked it up. He's called – he calls it rat poison now. So, uh, it, it uh, I think perceptions a lot. You know, it, uh, you're at the same place where you're at North Carolina. It's so visible. It's such a platform, but it's a fishbowl too. And, you know, the same places to where you're at when you're getting glamorized. I can't imagine that there's a better place to play in a country, back college basketball. If I played college, I can't imagine that there's any better places than North Carolina, Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, Indiana, UCLA. But there's so much going on in UCLA. Duke locally doesn't have a fan base. I would think as far as just the accolades and everything that goes, that North Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas, and Indiana would be the four best places just as far as the huge state fan base. You're just gods there. But I think it'd be the four of the worst places to play to because it's serious. If you're at Clemson or Florida State or somewhere like that in the ACC where they really love their football, they, you, you lose, well, that's okay. We're getting ready for spring practice. It's not a big deal. Fan, yeah. a lot, most places in, in – and in college basketball, in, in college campuses, people are not going to run to the ledge because the basketball team loses. Now, the football team loses is a whole different story. You know, you've got a handful of colleges that are different. North Carolina is up there on top where, you know, it can be miserable when you lose. It can be great when you win. And I, I would think that's the kind of place, too, where the whole environment could motivate you to, to want to be able to enjoy it, not, not have a really bad – uh, um, bad experience. It, it also puts more pressure on the kids and they feel it. Yeah. You know, in, in North Carolina football, there's anger when they lose, especially this past year, because they kind of thought the tide was going to finally turn and it didn't. But they're angry, but I don't sense the same kind of pain. And I remember talking to somebody in the program over at UNC here in the last year or so, and I said, you know, when North Carolina starts losing football games and the fans hurt, they physically, emotionally hurt. Not that they're anger, not that, be, that they become disinterested, apathetic, or anything like that, which has happened under Fedora, happened under Bunnings, happened a lot there with coaches. But actual pain, that means the program is in, is in the right place because it yeah. matters that much to people. The basketball program has been like that for decades. And I think sometimes when you're not doing well, that, that, that magnifies the not doing well. When you're at North Carolina and you lose to Miami and Wake Forest in the same week by combined 50 points, that's like 150 points because of everything that those guys feel. They feel the weight of all that. And they saw the flip side of it this year, which I thought was very fascinating. They saw the worst of the fan base. All of them did. And, the, and their parents experienced it, their families experienced it. And the players had a little group chat were the purpose of it was to put stuff that people sent them that was negatively said about them. And Leaky Black said, I was talking to him after the Duke game and right outside the locker room and doing an interview with a couple other reporters. And he said that during breakfast Saturday morning of the Duke game in the final four, that's all the players talked about. All they talked about was all the negativity. And, but what they were, but it was easier to talk about it then because they'd moved on from it because suddenly everybody that was criticizing him a couple of months earlier was celebrating them. So they saw both sides of it at extreme levels this year, the utter negativity and some of it was grotesque. And they saw the canonization of what it's like to be winning at that level at North Carolina. I thought it was one of the most fascinating things I've ever covered. You know, you get hardened, I think eventually to, to where I, I think you could get to a point where public sentiment, whatever people think, it just doesn't bother you, good or bad. You know, that you could, you you're, you hear so much of it that you can totally shut it down. I, I think, 
I think too, I see people that like that, that have all that popularity, you know, your, 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 your blue check guys on Twitter, like you who have all that, uh, that, that, uh, I think they eventually end up having fun with it. Yeah. You know, that, that they hear so much. They just, they just, it, it, it becomes like a sideline with them. So what was from a purely basketball standpoint, can you now with you know, hindsight's 2020, 20, right? Can you now go back and think in your mind, okay, here's a moment, there's a moment, and there's another moment where you kind of connect them and say, okay, that's when this that's when this changed. And it may not be an obvious thing. Like to me, <clears throat> before you answer, I think the win at Louisville was huge. Mm-hmm. Now they followed that up with the ugly loss at home to Duke. But they by getting that Louisville game in the bag, it's in the bag. You can't pull it out just because they were crap against Duke the next game. It was still there. And they knew that they could play poorly in some stretches, and they knew they could fight one out, and it was a back alley brawl. Then they go to Clemson and do the same kind of thing after the Duke game. So they book into Duke when the, when Leaky Black and another player said after the game, admittedly came around and said, well, they punched us and we didn't punch back. But they did punch at Louisville. They did punch at Clemson. I know that neither team is that good, but I think that that's the sequence where this team realized how, how to punch. And it's interesting that Hubert's speeches here the last couple of weeks were, we're not going to respond to a fight. We're going to look for a fight. We're going to start the fight. And I think that that was born out of that little stretch of games. What do you, what, what, what is it for you? I I think there are two things. I think number one, you had to build toughness, but you also had to build what you had on the court. Yeah. And because there were times this year, neither one of them were good. Neither one of them were good. They went hand in hand. They would have games where basketball wise, they were just overpowered and they looked horrible and they didn't look like they could beat anybody. And then what happened? They caved. So I take the toughest part. And I've talked about this before. There were three games. There were Louisville. There was a win at Clemson. And there was a win at Virginia Tech. I thought, though, and you look at those three teams, and I know none of them you're going to look at as final forward caliber team. They're not, they're not. Kansas, they're not UCLA, they're not Baylor, they're not anybody like that, like North Carolina beat the tournament. But it, uh, any road game's tough. And, you know, you go back and you think about at, at Louisville and especially at Clemson, it seemed like they made every big play. They made – as soon as the other team would make a big shot, well, a few seconds left, North Carolina would come right back on down on top of it make a big shot. They always yeah. responded – Virginia Tech, one was big. So I think that kind of built the toughness. And then I think to go to Cameron Indoor gave the team confidence and finally look at them and you say, yes, they are a good team now on the floor. I agree. They built the toughness. I thought the Duke thing, and, you know, Duke came back and took a lead, a pretty good-sized lead there in the first half. They made a big run, and North Carolina responded. But it all went together. But I think the on-the-court skill, talent part of it, to me, the flip got switched to Cameron Indoor. I, I think Virginia Tech was huge because it was coming off the pit game. And if people, they had pressure. They had a lot of pressure going to that game. If they lose that game, they don't make tournaments. Because unless they win in Brooklyn, and I'm not sure they would have won in Brooklyn, because I'm not sure they would have been the team they needed to be going into Durham if they would have lost that game. But I think that they gained confidence in Blacksburg, especially when Caleb wanted the ball in the last minute and he made those free throws. It's like they they controlled the way that game ended. Instead of making a play like they did at Louisville, like they did at Clemson, they controlled the way the game ended. They were strong. Like they beat a desperate Virginia Tech team in their building, and they were desperate as well. And I think that that game conference, they knew it was a quad one win. They finally got one, and it wasn't going to go away. It was always going to be a quad one win. I think that they, okay, now we got to put our sights on what's in front. And and then when they beat Syracuse, that was another one of those games where they fought it out, and they had gotten to the point where they were comfortable in close games. They were comfortable on both ends of the floor in close games. Uh, and then they go into Duke, and I think that there was just a different level. Like, we talked during the year, David, and Jacob and I in some of the videos that we did, and we kept saying, this could be a good team. This could be a better team than it is. And I think a lot of fans saw that too, which is why they were so frustrated. They were so frustrated that they had all these nice parts, and at times it would look really good, but, boy, there was a lot of space in between the parts. 
But yeah. when they went to Blacksburg, and even a little bit in that Virginia and that Louisville Clemson I was talking about, when they went to Blacksburg and the way they beat Louisville at home and the way they beat Syracuse at home, they started filling in those spaces in between the parts. They started filling it up with, you know, what I call fiber, basketball fiber. You got to have that stuff. If that if that accompanies the skill, then you got yourself a pretty good situation. And I think all that stuff just popped off like crazy in Durham. And it blew their minds maybe how good they were that night. They realized, okay, we can keep doing this. And other than the Virginia Tech game in the ACC tournament, which I think the team was kind of, eh, we don't really need to win anymore. Let's go, let's go get rid of this other tournament, which I really believe was – subconsciously in their minds that night. That's what they were after that. They were awesome against Marquette. They were awesome for 30 minutes against Baylor. And then they beat them in a brawl in overtime, held them one for 11 from the floor. They go play UCLA, which is a team a lot of people thought still could win the national title, as a, even as a four seed. And they held Juzang and, um, and Haquez to no points in the last 10 minutes of the game. So they started combining the grit and the fiber with all that skill. And that's what we saw. Uh, it was, it was almost like just a, like a mushroom cloud of, Oh, this is who we could be now. And we had to go through all that crap to become this and boom, we're here and we're not going away. And they just kept that thing going right up until Monday night. You know, and, and you, you go through every one of those games and with exception to Marquette, everything was a dog fight after that, yeah. you know, Baylor, even though they had to live with Baylor, and you go back and you think about this, Baylor cut that thing down in regulation, even with three or four minutes left, they were in a possession. They're, and they're doing it without Caleb Love and Manning. So they're trying to hang on. And then they give them in overtime and obviously do what you said. And then you get into UCLA. And, and then you get in, uh, you know, you've got that one. Then you've got the Duke game. I'm trying to remember – they all run together now. Who was the quarterfinal game? Uh, it was it was St. Peter's. Saint they had Peter's. to play. They had to, they had to play America. I, I forgot about that one in, in the whole scheme of things. But you know, you get Baylor then UCLA. So you get down to three or four minutes left. It's anybody's game against a team who had as much proven experience as any team in in the tournament. UCLA, and then you've got Duke and Duke's back and forth you know, in the final two minutes. And I kept thinking Monday night, you know, when North Carolina responded, made some big shots, because you kept thinking, okay, there's a point here where they can't return. They expended so much energy. Kansas get ready to put this thing away. And North Carolina would come back and make a bucket. And you look at it, and they're down two, or down three, and there would be a stop somewhere. And they get the ball. And I said, man, this feels like the Duke game all over again. Of course, you know, it's luck would have it, fate would have it. They didn't have it down at the end, but – Man, it was just – you kind of got used to where they were always finding a way to make a play down the stretch somewhere. And I was kind of thinking Monday night, well, I've seen them do this over and over and over and over now in tight ball games. Yeah. It's like we live for these things. I really think North Carolina is going to make – and I still thought somewhere when they threw the ball in and Kansas stepped out of bounds, I was like, my God, they're going to find someone to get this thing in overtime. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, they, they, they made believers out of all of us. How how um, how did your perception of and, and we're not we're going to do a different podcast on Hubert, but this is the players and Hubert related because it's the team, it's the program, they're, they're the ones everybody saw. How did your perception of North Carolina basketball change over the last six weeks, or did it change? Are you talking about the whole program, or just just, the just the program in general? But but the but the first thing people see in the program are the kids. So the kids that we saw kind of wobble all over the place for a few months suddenly weren't really well. Even if they weren't shooting well, they were still doing a lot of other things well. Like Caleb Love had a terrible shooting game in the finals, but he did a lot of other things well. I think he took some bad, more bad shots Monday night than he did earlier in the tournament and some of those other games. I think some of that fed into that run that Kansas had. But you still looked out there, and I think when Caleb took that shot, I think a lot of Carolina fans, a lot of people watching around the country thought that thing was going in because – he had grown to a point where you expect him to make that play. They had grown to a point, like you just said a second ago, people expected them to make a play. That wasn't the case two months earlier. And I think that that's the lasting impression of the program. And that's kind of what Carolina was for 
36 years under Dean Smith, whatever it was, or Roy, during Roy Williams era, even the three years of Bill Guthridge, they made those plays a hell of a lot more and they didn't. And suddenly in year one of Hubert Davis, with this outfit being what it once was this season, they're at the end in the biggest game and people are expecting them to make those plays. I'm still not wrapping my arms around what they what that team is. <laughs> and I'm not because there was such a metamorphosis, you know, from what they were to what they became. And you know what your expect your expectations are at North Carolina. They almost won the next championship, and I don't think anybody's going to confuse them with Worthy Perkins and Jordan and that team, you know, because this team, you know, they, they end up, I think they end up losing 10 games. So uh, it's not, it's, it's one that's going to be mentioned as one of the all time favorite teams, I think, but it's not going to be when you look at it and you say an all time great team. It'll be an all time favorite team, but not an all time great team. Uh, but the thing is, if, if teams, if they come back, if a lot of these guys come back, then the next year you could be looking at that. I, I still think, I still think they're evolving. Uh, huh. I know you're not going to have Manic back, but I don't think that, I don't think that Caleb Love and that RJ Davis, I don't think they're a finished product by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, you get Bay caught a fourth year. Just uh, how much better can he get? I mean, it's hard to improve on what he did, but my goodness. And then just the, them being used to each other. Uh, I just look at it as one of those teams that if they came back, that they came out of nowhere. And we've seen other teams do it in other sports. They finish strong. And hopefully everybody comes back and it kind of builds to that next year. Almost like a transition stage where you're not together, you're not very good, and then you you kind of – you improve and you do some great things, but you're still not there to what you could be. So like I said, I don't know exactly where it would be right now, but I think I would look at this team differently if Love, Davis, and Baycock come back, Leakey comes back, and then you say, okay, I think it was a springboard where they kind of transitioned. In, so that, that's kind of where I see it. In my, in my conversations with some pretty good sources, um, the impression that I'm getting right now is that Armando is a strong lean to return in part because he can – and I was a thing now, so we can't. We're not going to not talk about it. He can actually make perhaps more money through NIL than he would in a rookie contract in the NBA, and, and he needs more work. He needs to add to his game. I think he's an elite rebounder, and you need to be. You know, when I did that interview with Hubert the day after the pit game. It was about a story I was working on for Armando, and, and Hubert's like, "Look, in order to be in the league, in order to stick in the league, got to do something elite." And he said, "Armando's an elite rebounder, and and Armando is an elite rebounder." He proved that again here in the last six games. First guy in NCAA history to have double doubles in each of his six NCAA tournament games, shattering rebound records and stuff. But if you want to stick, unless you, you got to add more to your game, you got to be able to do more, I think, offensively than what he can do. My understanding is that a lot of people believe Caleb is sort of 50 50. Caleb understands he wants to get better, but maybe Caleb's ready to go just become a pro and, and work on just solely work on basketball, not to worry about other stuff. However, similar NIL package could be there for him, which might be more money than he would make at the next level. Plus buying one more year of patience and getting your game ready instead of it being a business would be something that would factor in the decision he makes. I don't think there's any concern about RJ. And the other thing would be leaky coming back in all indicators that I have been given is that it would be a surprise if he's not back that if he wanted to use the fifth year and come back, he would be welcome with wide open arms coming back. So uh, let me ask you, do you think Caleb Love should return from a purely basketball analyst standpoint? And why, what one or two reasons do you think he should return? And how could he benefit himself enough in one more year of college that would make a significant difference 
next spring as opposed to where he is this spring? My arguments are coming back. Now, let me say this. I, I hear a lot of – I'm a little different than most. I hear a lot of arguments sometimes. Well, player X should come back because he's not good enough in the pros. But I think the pros, as far as being able to develop talent, you have such a luxury there because they get more time with the players. You've got a 20-hour limit in the NCAA that coaches can work with you each week. You go to the pros, and it's like, you know, John Lucas, the great Maryland point guard. Uh, they asked him one time, you know, he, he I've, I've known him for years, and, um, you know, he he's a, was a great player developer, had uh, had a, was a teacher out of Houston, had players come in from everywhere that he worked with, was a great trainer. And somebody asked him, you know, have you thought about – coaching college basketball. He said, we'd be on probation in a week. And <laughs> he said, you mean you pay players? He said, no, I wouldn't pay players. We'd just practice 100 hours a week. You'd be, you'd be like Jerry Tarkanian. They'd have to put cameras up in the ceiling, you know, to watch him doing extra practices and things. So there, I, I, think, I think as far as people don't think that out when they look at the development stage of it, yeah. you want to get developed. The pros are great. Here's my argument for doing. Let me jump in real fast, if you don't mind. I, I'm going to back up what you just said, and, and I, I'm allowed one interruption, so I interrupted that time. Yeah. But, but this this speaks to what you're saying, and you'll understand this. A lot of our listeners will understand this as well. When I was at Fox Sports, I covered the Bobcats some, and I, they were also doing that American Idol stuff on Fox TV, right? So one of the Bobcats cheerleaders was one of the 20 finalists for American Idol. So I had to go real early before a game. I don't remember. They were playing the, the Knicks, I guess it was. Yeah, so uh, Jeremy Lin was with the Knicks when he exploded. Lin, Lin Sanity, I think he was with the Knicks. So I went real early to do all these interviews with the cheerleader who was an American Idol and their teammates and that kind of thing. And I showed up about three hours before game time. And working out with one coach, Working his butt off, getting what I would consider the most impressive one-man workout I'd ever seen in my life was Jeremy Lin. About two weeks later, he exploded on the NBA scene when Sanity was born. And I sat there waiting for the interview, watching for about 30, 25 or 30 minutes the workout he was getting. They kept having to, to wipe the floor because of the sweat that was pouring off him. That speaks to what you're talking about right there. They know how to individually do that John Lucas stuff with these guys, and they know exactly what needs to be burned and what needs and what what doesn't, and, and they can bring the best out of you. So if a guy like Caleb did go, it's going to get a ton of that one-on-one -on -one work where they're going to be totally honest with him, and it's not about winning games with him. It's about getting better, and that would be the sole focus. So I wanted to kind of back up what you yeah. were saying about what they do at the next level and how intense it is. Yeah. Now, the argument for him staying, um, three things. There's no way you can't build your brand in the G League the way you can in college basketball. You just can't do it. Or overtime or whatever you play. Uh, but it would be G League, two-way contract, whatever. You know, you can build your brand so much better. Um, unless you're a lottery pick, now – I don't know that you can get – you could make as much money as you could playing at a high-profile university. Uh, used to, I would say this. If you'd asked me a year ago, a year, 2021, I would have said this. If you are not in the first round, stay. If you are in the first round and you get guaranteed money, then you go. Because second round, even if you're the first pick in the second round, there's nothing guaranteed. You're not guaranteed a roster spot. You're not guaranteed salary, anything. But now I would say on up, maybe even if you're at the right place and you're not chosen in the top 10, top 15, you could make more money uh, uh, through NIL. NIL is a total game changer. But the other thing is this. I think playing – in a winning situation, North Carolina is a little bit different. You can come back and not just a thing, hey, being a part of something and we, and not even that thing of just saying, you know, we come back next year, we can win a national championship. I'm going to talk about that. I think learning how to win is a skill and I being agree. where you're there and you, you, you know how to win, 
And I don't know that he has that yet. I don't know that any of these guys have that yet. They're getting it. Like we said, it's a work in progress. It's kind of a springboard. But what next year where you can win the ACC, you can win, you can go 33 and four or whatever, let's say, win a bunch of games, win titles, you get that winning pedigree. And all of a sudden, you can look at Caleb Love and people will say, you know, he's kind of a wild card. He's up and down. He's inconsistent. How much more attractive would Caleb Love be in a draft if, if they looked at him and said, you know what, he's consistent. And he, he he's a winner, and he's consistent. He does those things to win. And I, I think it makes a huge deal about coming back. So And, he, I, and, I, and the mature I, decision of coming back, David. Huh? The mature decision of coming back. There's a, it's a mature decision. It's an easier decision to just go and take the money, right? But I think there's a there's a bit of maturity that comes with coming going back to school and and recognizing the value of patience. Yeah, I agree. And and like I said, there's a lot to be said for it. I just think right now, especially if you're not a first round draft pick, if you're in North Carolina with everything they've got to offer there. If you don't go in that first 15, first 20, maybe even higher. I, I know of a player right now that his camp saying that they want to uh, they want to make sure he's in the top 10 before they go. He's in a similar situation. So, so I, I would uh, I would like I said, I I just feel like uh, there there's a, a ton of reasons to come back. I don't necessarily look at it as being, well, he's not good enough. I don't think that's ever a reason because, man, you can get great training up there. Yep. But I, I think there's a lot of things that, that North Carolina offers, intangibles, things on the periphery uh, that are huge reasons to, to return for another year. Okay. Same thing applies with Armando, but what area can you see getting better than Armando? And before you answer that, I will say this. I was talking with a couple of writers I respect greatly. They're like, you know, how much can he get better at his offensive game at this level? How, how much bouncier is he going to get? It, it, you know, Hubert had him make a thousand threes a week in the offseason. Maybe instead he should have had him make a thousand twelve to fifteen footers because that's going to be worse game. He's never going to have a perimeter game. He might be thirty years old by the time he has any kind of perimeter game. And some bigs get to the league and they develop a little bit of that over time. But you know, you want to you want to. You want to have that time. You got to be able to do something to make the roster so you end up playing until you're 30 years old. So what can you see? How can you see him improving in another year of college? Because he's already one of the best, if not the best, I mean, he's the second best rebounder, I guess, in college basketball. The first, the best one is over in Kentucky. But he's damn good. And he's become a very good defensive player. And and he's a he, and he does not he's not one of these guys who could be a high volume scorer that has to have the ball a ton because he's a pretty good passer and he's a willing passer. So what can he improve that would make him more appealing to an NBA team next year as opposed to right now? I think you go back a year and look at the things that they said Dayron Sharp needed to get need to work on. You know when he started when Dayron went and got a trainer and really started working out for the draft. And then they showed some videos of him. He had dropped weight. You know, his body kind of changed. It really leaned up. They were working on a lot more perimeter stuff. They were working on quickness. They are working on agility. And, see, I think Armando made a big improvement this year. He had some stuff in him that I didn't know he had, just being able to play in the full court. You know, we, we looked at some – games we looked I put up some videos of full court stuff when he wasn't even in the in the screen and he ends up blocking a shot or getting a big offensive put back out of nowhere going 94 feet now nobody's gonna nobody's gonna confuse him with with uh uh Hussein Bolt or anybody like that but you know he's uh you know I think he's quicker than most people realize but here's the thing too he turned into a pretty good rim protector so that's the thing. If he can protect rim, the rim, like a little bouncer, show that he can block some shots. I think being able to – this is one thing that I liked about him. I saw several times in the tournament, he got switched on to guards. Guards tried to go by and get to the rim, really good ones, and he blocked the he blocked shot. So proving that he can do that, get more reps at that, getting quicker, probably leaning up a little bit, uh, 
and 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 just kind of developing all that. Uh, and, and those are things. The NBA is not looking for back to the bucket guys in the post because it's a game of space. Uh, if anybody's not seen the JJ Reddick video where he's really giving Aaron Torres down the road, it's pretty funny. And I like Aaron, but Aaron had made the statement that if if they played any defense in the, you know, in the NBA, like Texas Tech and some of these teams play, that NBA teams were going to score in the 70s. And J.J. Reddick said, are you kidding? You know, have you seen the space that these guys play in? You can't guard them. And so I said that to say this, it's a game of space. And for bigs, it's you, you camp out down on the block, takes away driving lanes. You know, and that's not what the modern-day game, you know, the, the modern-day big, protects the rim, plays the screen and roll, screen and pops and shoots, runs the floor, protects the rim. That's what they, they do. So they want, they want more of a, a long, lengthy, bouncy stretch guy than they do a big bruiser in there because there's just no place for them now in the NBA. Excellent point about Armando's ability on the switches. Uh, Tiger Campbell, UCLA, is a classic example. He forced a walk with two and a half minutes left in that game. Campbell thought he could drive on him. He was unable to. All I think that I really like about Armando's game, the league will love too, is he's become a very smart player. You were talking about the rim protector. You know, rim protector, you have to know how to read, react, and anticipate. And he became really good at that this year. You know, he wasn't swatting stuff away like when Sean Bradley played that year at BYU and he blocked like eight shots a game, whatever it was. But he affected a lot of shots. He was in the heads of guys when they went into the paint because, A, he could get to the ball. B, his body. I just think his use of his midsection, and we saw that with the screens that you have articulated so well here the last month. You know, when you're a great screener, you've got to have a great midsection. You have to be in control of your midsection. And, and he became that guy. So I, everything I'm hearing is that there's that he's coming back, and they, people think he's coming back. They say, you know, there's no reason for him not to. He can get better. He's going to get a ton of money from NIL, a lot more than he would get in a rookie contract. But when I start to parse his game, I just want to know what one area can he could be just demonstratively better next year than where he is right now that would people say, okay, I definitely can use this guy now. So I think there's a half dozen areas for Taylor. That can to, he could leap his, he could skyrocket his game in those areas big time, make himself an absolute NBA player. I'm kind of curious where it is with Armando. I think just continuing on those things, showing that, proving even more that hey, yes, I can switch on that guard perimeters. Um, I can run the floor, you know, and like you say, maybe stretch. And I think they're always going to look for a, a, a jump shot. More of a jump shot. Like you say, it may not be a three. It may be more extending the two, getting really, really comfortable out to about 18 feet, being able to do that. But I, I would look more at, with the exception of rim protection, showing maybe that he's, he's bouncier than what people think, um, would be perimeter skills, uh, working on those other things, full court skills. I think, but I say I don't think it would hurt to. I just don't think it would hurt to to, to really. It's what they're going to do in the NBA when he gets in the trainer. Man, they're really going to work on leaning up a little bit. So I think yeah, that I agree that's with that thing too. David, outstanding stuff. Uh, we're going to do a lot more stuff here in the next month or so, talking about the Carolina basketball team, looking into the future, whatever moves guys make. We will be on top of it. Either David and I will do some videos. Jacob and I will do some videos as well. And we're going to do one on Hubert Davis. We're going to focus a little bit more on him. That's the next one we're going to run here. So this one first, then Hubert Davis. And um, can't wait to get David's thoughts on what he thinks, uh, where he thinks Hubert is now as a coach. So stay with us on that next podcast when that one rolls about a day or so after this one uh, pops for you guys. He's David Sisk. I'm Andrew Jones. We appreciate you guys stopping by.